All right, well, we are at noon. Welcome everyone. Um, you're uh, here at an event, it's part of the Teaching and Learning Center's Professional Development Series. Uh, for those of you who are interested, we have these events every Wednesday at noon. It's not always a teaching chat, but uh, we have events every Wednesday at noon. And my colleague is going to drop a link into the chat about how you can get professional development certificate, either as a graduate student or a faculty or staff member. And also, if you wanted to become a TLC fellow um, and enhance the excellence of teaching of others, you could do that as well. So that information is available for you there. And we hope you take advantage of that because I love these events and I love being here with all of you and talking about all things teaching. Um, on the teaching chat days, it really is kind of all things teaching because this is sort of like if the TLC had office hours. Now, comment on that. Number one, um, when we're teaching, I actually recommend you use student hours, not office hours. I will admit I was not smart enough to come up with that myself, but the literature has this, is that when you have office hours, students don't always know what that means. And I've even had students, first, first year students who have thought my office hours were the time that I was in my office doing my research and not the time where they could come and talk to me. So using a term like student hours, the literature shows is much clearer to students and they're more likely to take advantage of those. So I'll call this, you know, kind of our hour is, is what this will be this, on, uh, on these teaching chat days. So we don't have a schedule of presenter. I always have five or six questions that I am very interested in hearing people respond to. We never even get through all of my questions because as something that is gonna be kind of audience driven and, I'm going to let that go to voicemail, so I apologize. I don't know who's calling me. Um, my first question is, do you have a question that you would like to consider? And I'm going to go on mute for five seconds till my phone stops ringing. I have one. <clears throat> Von Bergen, what do you got? Well, I will just, <clears throat> it's rather brief. I'll post it in the chat. All right, so you'd actually sent this to me a little bit earlier today. I'd provide my feedback. We'll see if other people um, agree with what you or I thought. So if you're reading the chat, and if not, I'll read it out loud for you. Don Von Bergen is saying that he gave a 45 question test in Canvas, all multiple choice or true false answers. He decided four questions were not suitable for the test because they weren't sufficiently covered in class, gave everyone full credit for these questions. There's a student who thinks he should get extra credit four points because he answered those questions correctly. Um, Don said then he would not do this, can't do this just for him. He had no idea if he or the others just made lucky guesses. So he's sticking with that initial solution to give everyone credit in Canvas. And what I think he's asking is, how do we feel about that decision? I've already told him my feelings. I'll tell you my feelings at the end. But before we get to my feelings, what do y'all think? And as always, you can drop it in the chat and I'll read it out loud for you, or you can unmute yourself and just talk. Greg is giving you a thumbs up. I'm seeing more thumbs up kind of showing in. More thumbs up, lots of nodding. Um, at this point, I will say that I, as I said in uh, my response to Von Bergen, that's exactly what I do in my classes when that issue emerges. The issue I wanna kind of raise here though too is that we should be on the lookout for unfair items on our exams. One of the things that I found in my multiple choice exams, I do item analyses. I, the first thing I look at is to make sure that the most common answer was the right one. Then I kind of look through what are the competing answers? Are there other answers that there's a plausible case that they are also correct? And in those instances, I will create corrections such that maybe I'll accept more than one correct answer or maybe all answers is correct depending on how bad that item was. In those situations, I believe if the item is completely nonsensical, Students may not even guess the best answer because they have no idea what it's coming at, get anxious and just press D. So I think in those situations, and I've had to do these situations, that's exactly what I would do. And I would credit the entire class because I have no idea why they got that item wrong if the item is unfair. So Von Bergen, good job in my opinion. I appreciate the collective feedback, that's helpful. Sure. So what other questions or issues are people having now? We'll get to happier questions as we kind of go through, but I want to make sure if anyone has like an immediate crisis that they need dealt with, that we have time to do that. I, I have a I think question. Natalie's waving. Oh, sorry. 
Oh, and Natalie is conceding to Beth. Beth, Natalie will come back. Yeah, go for it, Beth. <laughs> All right. Oh, okay. Um, so um, uh, I, I had to um, make some adjustments to a policy in one of my online courses. Um, and I made that announcement. I gave rationale, provided all of that, explained that I had been very reflective. Here are some of the steps that I'd taken. Here's why we were doing it. And I have um, a couple of students, um, when I, I asked them to acknowledge that they knew about the policy update and then gave them a chance to offer any comments or feedback afterwards. And um, most of the comments or feedback were very complimentary. They were very agreeable. They understood. They appreciated the fact that I was modeling, you know, reflective practices in the classroom, et cetera. Um, but I do have one in particular and another one that was similar that um, ha is having a great issue with the fact that I changed the policy mid-course. Um, and um, I guess I'm just wondering, um, you know, what is if you were doing something like this, would you just address it like with that one person, um, you know, one on one? Would you email like um, I'm just feeling a little uncertain about how they're feeling about all of it now based on their comments. And I don't know how to kind of move forward with it um, without just like I don't want to I don't know. I'm trying to be respectful. I think wanting to be respectful is always a, a good decision. I see that uh, Deborah has a, a comment. Um, I would suggest that you make sure that in your syllabus that there is a disclaimer at the bottom of your syllabus saying that it is subject to change. And um, I think that's sufficient to, to say, you know, I've always had this flexibility built into my policies. Um, if they feel like they're being treated unfairly and that this puts them at a disadvantage, I would consider, is this disadvantaging someone um, or is it actually a policy change that is making the course more um, equitable to students? If it's, if it's for the positive, it's more equitable. Uh, I think that, you know, explaining to that one student, you know, that we are trying to raise our standards so that we are helping our students to have a better playing field. Uh, some students already are, are at an advantage anyway. So if it's not disadvantaging someone unfairly and it's helping other one, others to have a, a level playing field, explain that to the student and maybe it'll be a learning opportunity for them. And That's one of the things thing. that I'll, sorry, I'll say about- Sorry, I was about, talking, I was muted. I'm oh, sorry. Uh, when, when, when Deborah yeah. provides an opinion, Deborah, for those of you who don't know, is one of the instructional designers here at K-State and also a champion for inclusive teaching and accessibility. So often when Deborah is giving their opinion, it's actually a best practice. So that's, I really appreciate you chiming in with that, Deborah. Don, I see your hand is up. Um, yeah, Beth, did you say you had an opportunity to speak with uh, these one or two students face-to-face -face in private? Not yet. And they okay. are, um, they're students in my online course. So they may or may not even, you know, live here. I could definitely set up like a Zoom chat or something like yeah. that with them. But I, I just I, wasn't, I, would, I just don't want to step on, like if they made the comment and didn't anticipate me like addressing them one-on-one, -on -one, you know, like I don't want to call them out, I guess. That would be my suggestion and encouragement along with what Deborah already shared. I agree with um suggestions she made but if you haven't met um yeah just zoom up team them whatever and you might find um uh, they just misunderstood something and you can accommodate them reassure them that it's you know you're looking out for their interest and their best interest as well as the whole class thank you So Beth, how do you feel about that? I I feel good. I think that's where I was headed. I just didn't, you know, I didn't want to feel like the student, you know, was feeling called out or singled out in any way. I'm obviously not going to do it in front of other people, um, but I didn't, you know, that was, but that was kind of where I was leaning. So 
I, I think one of the things that makes that, you know, a little bit more complicated situation is because it is an online class, right? It's, it's not as easy to just grab the student for a couple minutes before or after class or have that kind of happen organically. There now has to be this additional intentional layer to create contact. And I would imagine that this would be less a situation if it were not an online class. Yes, probably. So other issues or concerns that people are having and they want to talk through. I know I have, I have a couple. I always have a couple, but um, what else? Oh, this is not an issue per se. I'll say it that way to, um, to start it. It's, it's rare that I confess to my students that I underestimated something or that I uh, apologize for their non-performance because I hold myself responsible for that. And uh, this week I felt like I needed to say that to them and to say that let's talk about our way of um, remedying that on the next project or ways that we both can come to a, a solution that's, that's gonna help them the most. And it felt good to, to be able to be honest and to just say, hey, you know, I was really busy with this meeting and that meeting and I didn't spend as much time with you as I would have liked to. And the work shows that. And I will, though I will make comments on your work that shows what you should have done, I will not hold you totally accountable for that. And I, I felt like a big girl, <laughs> so to speak, <laughs> that I was able to express that and not have them angry or blame me for something that they saw in another class that wasn't happening in mine. So it wasn't, it wasn't that I'm expressing a concern. Um, it, it worked out very well, uh, but it's a difficult thing, I think, sometimes for teachers to do. Let me say it that way. LB, I think that's amazing. I mean, I, I think it's it's one of those situations where you taught them more than the content in doing that. You taught them how to adult. And, and I think sometimes seeing us just be appropriately humble um, is important. It's a good demonstration of the growth mindset. That's, that's an awesome thing to share with us and with your students. Now, that's something that I think it's easier to do with time, right? So when, you, when you've been a teacher for a little bit and you're maybe a little bit more comfortable in your practices, you have a little more experience, are there any recommendations for helping someone? A lot of people who come to these haven't been teaching maybe as, as long as, as LB or I have been teaching. Um, what kind of advice would we have for helping people earlier in their career, earlier in their experience for taking on something that makes them feel so vulnerable? Uh, Don, can I can I jump in Absolutely. here? Absolutely, Greg. What I like about what La Barbara did is, um, though on the one hand she is she's taken uh, responsibility there, um, and but she did it in such a way like, hey, we didn't achieve the learning goals that we were supposed to as a class, and I'm going to take some responsibility here for that, but come on, we're all, this is where we're going in terms of the learning. These are the, the outcomes. And I think that works. What I don't think works for um, uh, new instructors or anyone is to criticize yourself as a teacher in front of the students and like, oh, I guess I'm just not a very good teacher or I'm so, oh, I'm so disorganized today or I didn't quite understand that concept either. I, I, Cause I think that starts to freak students out. Um, and particularly if you're a newer instructor, I think you wanna be, you wanna give them a kind of calm reassurance um, and if, if, if something went wrong, I think taking responsibility for it, refocusing the class on the learning that you want to have happen, uh, and then how we're going to get there is important. But um, I think this is a venue for let's self-critique and rethink, but not in front of your students, in my opinion. And the reason I say that isn't because I don't want people to be dishonest or fake it till you make it. Not at all. I, it's just... I think it stresses students out to worry that their teacher doesn't know what they're doing. Yeah. So don't I ever think do that. That's an excellent point, Greg. And I think 
we are worried, especially early when we haven't done this lots of times, we will make mistakes. We'll have to fess up to our mistakes, but early on, we do think it's sacrificing our expertise, right? It's kind of hampering our legitimacy as a teacher. And I agree complete with Greg that the way you did that LB was actually empowering of your students and letting them know that you were prepared to support them. Well, yeah. I think it also, uh, I think it depends on the relationship that you have with them already, certainly in a studio where you're talking about 18 students that I see three times a week for five hours each, I mean, pretty much, I've developed a real community in that room. And as much as I want them to be vulnerable and say, hey, not be critical, but be vulnerable to say when they were not responsible for taking, taking care of something that was homework or in, in doing what was necessary to learn, I want them to recognize that I also may be in that same place. I'm a, I'm a human being. And it, it wasn't just about demonstration, but it was something that I had, hadn't done in a long time in that way. And I thought it through long before I actually did it. So over the weekend, it was something that I thought about on the way into work. Uh, right before that class, I thought about how I was going to say this and how I was also going to follow up that statement with something that I knew they would be empowered to do. And that was, we rearranged our room and I left it to them. I said, you know, some things aren't working. They said some things weren't working and I left it to them. And I went back yesterday and it was so much better. And I gave them immediate kudos and said, wow, you all did a great job. This is the best organization I've ever seen. You really designers. And you got more space. And I, I just gave them all kinds of praises. And of course, they were, they were in a different place this morning. And now a couple of them have come back and said, oh, I am so glad that you, re you, know, you all rearranged it this way. Because before, I wasn't talking. And I felt like alienated. And today is the most I've ever talked in this class. So there was a follow-up that gave them a chance to be really empowered. And they took it on. And I gave them all the credit in the world for that. So I think it was a progression of our relationship and what I said, and then what they were empowered to do. LB, I want to follow up with a, a line of discussion I want to have in a second. The line of discussion is how do we create that community and rapport with our students by which we then give each other grace? But before we get to that point, I want to point out something that sometimes is kind of a myth about excellent teaching. There's a myth that excellent teachers were just kind of born that way, right? They were just naturally amazing. And one of the things that I love about K-State and the time that I've spent here is I have an opportunity to be friends and talk about teaching with lots of people on this campus, right? Greg Eisland is in this call. Greg Eisland is one of my teaching heroes at K-State. And one of the things that I think he will tell you, because he's told me this, is that it's because he works really hard at it. It's not something where Greg just works into class or any of us work into class and we just know how to do everything. LB talked about the planning, the intention, the design, the deliberation, the incubation on the ideas, and then the follow through on that plan. And one of the things I think was most empowering to me in thinking about how to become a better teacher is to realize that great teachers prepare really, really well, and they put time into doing it. It's not a natural thing that they came out of the womb being stunningly passionate and engaging in the classroom. So I did want to kind of amplify that LB's excellence there was a product of the preparation that you kind of put in in that design. And sometimes we forget that. Can I jump well, in on that too? Sorry. Yeah, Andy. I wanted to say like one of the things that I like about that, and I think that it's important when we're acknowledging things that we can do better with our students, I think it is important to acknowledge when we don't hold up our end of the bargain. But what I like about what LB said is that it goes along with what, what a real apology is. My husband always goes on with this with our kids, you know, is that a real apology is an acknowledgement of what, what went wrong and a promise to do better. You know, and so I like that it's saying like, so this is where I went wrong. This is this is something that like I recognize that I could have done better in this situation. And this is my promise to you. And this is and then that follow through that Don was saying, like coming back and saying, like, you know what, like this is something I realized that I messed up. I should have given you this information 
last week, I, I didn't realize that I didn't upload this document. I didn't, whatever, you know, we all have those things. Canvas is the bane of my existence with the number of times that I forget to hit publish on something. Um, but just being real about like your circumstances and situations and then promising to do better the next time. Um, and even like bringing into dialogue with students, you know, what can I do? What would make this easier for you? What are the things that you can do to, you know, support your own learning? I think that having that open dialogue and this goes into, you know, what can you do to build that community? I think that having those open conversations throughout your class, like what are you doing and what am I doing to help with this learning community and putting the onus on everyone rather than having it just be like, I, as the instructor, am the sole person in charge of making sure that you learn. Like, no, I'm here to provide opportunities. Like, now let's talk about like, how can we as a community work together to support each other, to support ourselves and to have a great learning environment. But, you Andy, know, I love that comment and the transition to our next point. So thank you for doing that. Um, <laughs> and and I'll kind of kind of extend Andy's comment into a question is, how do we turn our classes into learning communities? Because there are a lot of students who think that the person in front of the class should do all the talking. I'm going to write down as much as I can, and then I'm going to try to do well in the assessments as I can. I don't want to hear my colleagues talk. I don't want to talk myself. So how do we create the impetus for a learning community and the importance of learning community among our classes? Well, I, I, since I was going to say this, I'll say it now because it responds to that. It's also, I think community has to, it's a Scott Peck dynamics, if you will, of how you establish community. And I think one of them is trust, obviously. And the other is how you handle criticism. And I think when you can demonstrate criticism in a way for your students to understand that, that they are able to both self-criticize their own work, but also help each other in that evaluation. So no one comes out upset because in architecture, there's a lot of criticism as in other disciplines. And we talk so much about not getting upset or pumped up because your faculty says you didn't do something right. But another student has that option as well to say to their classmate, I think you could have done it this way or that way. It's a community activity. And so not only was I demonstrating criticism to them, but giving them an opportunity to do that with each other because I asked them to do that. So I think that's part of how one establishes uh, community. I think the other thing that for me that I've learned from Scott Peck was that there's something called emptying and we don't want to empty everything that happens to us or, or whatever with our students. But I think in community, one has to be willing to get off your chest something that is important to you in a way that, if we want to use your word, has an empathetic tone and that that then becomes part of how community starts to, the, the members of your community start to understand you and where you come from so that there's honesty. So this is something that I teach in community development and that's the reason why I started the conversation. And I will say that uh, Andy uses the term evaluate rather than criticize uh, in their classes to kind of help with that too. I'm a, I'm a huge fan of feedback. Um, I'm a huge fan of talking about things we can improve, not things we've done wrong. And, and I think that that framing and that trust we can build through that process is helpful. I'm kind of curious though, like I, um, these, are, these are deep into the semester kinds of things. Actually, I'm sorry, Beth, you were gonna talk, my bad. No, that's okay. Um, I was just gonna say, I think that in order to get though to trust, there are things you have to do before that. And um, so, you have to know each other. The students have to know each other. You have to know the students. They need to know you. So there's a level of um, relationship building that's there. There's a lot of research out there on the impact of that positive teacher-student relationship in the 
the entire community um, perspective. And then from there, you have to be able to identify your commonalities, how you're different, the strengths that you all have so that you can work within those, right? And know, okay, if I'm working with this group, right? With this person, they're strong with this and I'm strong with this. So we're gonna lean on them or vice versa. Um, and you also have to establish shared norms for learning. So they have to understand, you know, together, this is what our community is going to, to work like. This is how we're going to, you know, do things. Um, and then I think there has to be elements of collaboration built into everything that you do so that they can do all of those things. So they can get to know each other better so that they can, you know, start to establish those and they can really utilize that. And the more that they do that, the more they get to know each other, the more they work with each other, the better that trust can be built. And it's the same with, with, you know, you as the teacher. So like with me, the more that I get to know them, the more I do to come alongside them, to learn about them, the more trust that they're going to have and with that give and take with me. So um, I think those are some really important pieces to build up to that. It's not just something that starts from day one. I mean, like community isn't like you don't, they don't walk in and they're, you know, this amazing community. Like you have to really, you have to work at developing that and you have to be intentional with the design of your instruction, the strategies that you use and how you are having them work together so that that trust can be built. And then you can move forward um, in lots of different ways once that's established. So Beth, that's amazing because the question I was going to ask is, you know, that's deep in the semester what LB is talking about. How do we start that process? And then that's what you talked about. So we're, we're on the same wavelength today. I love that. Um, one of the things I'll say is you said it doesn't start, it doesn't happen on day one. It doesn't, but it starts on day one, right? And it's got to be something that immediately, very early on, we're including that. Something that I'm I stealing from this, uh, Cheryl put into the chat about connection before content. I love sound bites. I love when you can take an economy of words and get that. I'm teaching about community building in my class tomorrow, and I am super stealing that. So thank you so much for offering that, Cheryl. Andy, I see your hand. So I wanted to uh, make a comment based on uh, what Beth had just said, and then Andrew put in the, the chat just exactly what I wanted to comment to, is that I think that some people, uh, I wanted to take a moment for those who teach bigger classes and kind of feel like I can't have these community moments in the class. Um, I think that to take a break and, and try to figure out where you can, because in big, big classes like that, that I've had before, I think that finding ways to like pare down and put students, like you can put them into groups in Canvas for discussion boards or other things where all through the semester, you're having them work with a smaller group or having them in class, like, you know, work in groups of three or four to discuss X topic during you know the first minute or two of class and then check in at another point in class, but having those moments of connection throughout the course, even if it's a lecture based course where you're mostly talking at them it's a huge class with a lot of students. There's still opportunity to create a sense of community in that class. You have to think about it a little bit more creatively than if you have you know a small class of. 20 students for for instance but um but there's a lot of ways that you can do that thinking about okay how can i get you know connect students so that they're working with a smaller number of students on a regular basis or meeting face to face with a smaller group during class to check in on how they're feeling about a topic or what their opinion is what they think um i think that it's it's easy to pretend like large lecture classes can't have community, but I think that that's kind of detrimental and um, and having that is is important. And I would say that Andy's comments on that are echoed in the chat from a couple other people who have weighed in. And yeah, Andy said it might happen a little differently, um, but it is definitely something that's useful. Uh, Melissa, I see your hand. So something I do in my classes is I put 
learning objectives, although I call them learning goals for students, I I put them at the uh, on the projector at the very beginning of the class every day so they know what to expect, what we're going to cover, and what I want them to learn. And every single day, number one is learn names and build a strong learning community. And so they see it every day. They know it's part of the plan. It's part of the goal. And I continue to, I have relatively small classes. 25 is the largest class I have. Um, so learning everybody's names is more doable. But I ask them every class period, anybody know, feel like they know everybody's names yet? And I still, at week five, only get a handful of people. So I'm like, okay, so we're going to keep working on it just to validate that for them. Um, but I think that being super transparent that it's a part of your class is helpful. I think if you can also connect it directly to things that they would value, it helps. So I teach two sections of a writing course that students majoring, um, students in the College of Business take. And so we talk about networking and small talk and being able to communicate within their field. And so I say, you need to be able to talk to people. So even though this just, you know, this isn't just fun and games and activities, this is purposeful skills for the future. So some students are like, that's ah, fun, I'm, I'm on board. And other students are like, I don't know, it needs to be useful to me. If you can connect it to how it will be useful for them as a soft skill, I think they'll buy into it as well. I think showing that it's not fluff that is extra to the course, but it's actually part of the course, I think is a great strategy, Melissa. Von Bergen. Uh, yeah, Melissa mentioned making connections and learning names. Uh, I was at a two-week course in Harvard a few years back, and the class consisted of department heads, deans, presidents, president wannabes. And what was amazing, that that was a fairly large class, not giant, but uh, close to 100. And from day one in the full two weeks to get people to connect so that people could begin to learn names, refer to each other on day one using their first names, uh, they had name tags. So every semester, uh, and I'll do this for a class as big as 50, I make these name tags. It's pretty, they're pretty easy to make. As you can tell, they're handmade. I use file folders, you know, file folders. And I, I think that's been a success because I can learn names faster. I can look students in the face and refer to them by their first names. Uh, they seem to like it. And then I encourage them to get to know each other better. And this is the way that they can do that rather than, you know, they're sitting in a class with a bunch of strangers and they have no idea who is who. So that's it's a small step, but it's a step I take in the beginning of the semester. Thank you, Von Bergen. LB. I'm gonna switch subjects as I always do. <laughs> but I'll make a I'll make a point of a, of someone who is not here any longer, Mick Charney, who is one of our distinguished uh, chair, uh, Kaufman chair, said to me, um, and I've watched him do this in a very large lecture he would have uh, commercials at the very beginning while students were coming in, play music, do things to change the mood of teaching. In other words, the connection happened before the content did. And if a student group had an announcement or had a slide, he would allow that slide to be put up and for them to discuss it before he started his content. It, it makes me think of something in DEIB, which uh, I'm getting ready to do a, a workshop tomorrow in Engaged Scholarship Consortium on this very subject. And I was beginning to think about different cultures who start meetings in different ways. And it dawned on me that administrators probably need a playtime or just a conversing time of fun before they get into content because it changes the whole mood in the room. And so it would be interesting to allow our students to have that talk time. Just, it could be a subject that we prescribe or it could be uh, them just having a time to visit with each other. And, and then we start content and the content may then relate to what we just had them do as an exercise. So. There, there are all kinds of ways, I think, with small groups as well as large groups to think about culturally how 
people start meetings and how uh, in Mexico and, and indigenous people did a lot of socialization uh, prior to the business happening. We can't spend that much time on it, but we can give moments of that that I think uh, also help our international students understand how the American way is, uh, that, that it's different than perhaps the way that they are used to in their own countries. And it, it could be a, a great way of exposing us all to different cultural um, relevancy. LB, I love that comment. And I love us kind of thinking more broadly beyond the things that we already think. That is excellent. Um, there's a couple of ideas in the chat you can check out. Uh, one I'll point out, um, Beth talked about this, this cool thing about not only having name tents, but having this chart where there's two rows. And on the top row, when they sign in, they, they sign something to Beth. And then she writes back to all of them um, on the, the bottom a little bit. So it's a, it's a neat little interaction that, uh, that they can do. What kind of things do they write, Beth? if you don't mind me asking. So the first day they're all kind of like, oh, what should I write? So sometimes I'm just like, hey, just tell me anything. Tell me how you're feeling. what do you think about today? So a lot of them are scared to come into my class because it's a science methods class for elementary and they haven't had very positive experiences in science. So they usually are not excited about it. So they typically will, the first day they're like, okay, like, I love your energy. I love, you know, like this class was so exciting today. It's made me excited about learning more about teaching science. Sometimes they just tell me like um, things about their weekend or my birthday's coming up. Um, of course, as you know, as you go through the four sections, it gets, it typically gets a little deeper each time with most students. Some students are still, they keep it very surface level, but um, like I had one student tell me she shouldn't drink a Red Bull before coming to class because she was on the edge of her seat the whole time, which is funny, right? And so I responded back and we and laughed about it and um, I said, well, I didn't even notice, but I love it, you know? Um, and then they ask questions of me. Um, they wanna find out about my life. They ask um, things about teaching because um, I'm in the College of Ed, right? So they're um, pre-service teachers. Um, somebody made a comment about um, excited about Valentine's Day and the parties and they were going to be in the classroom to work with that and so I made a comment that said something like um, oh I remember those days you know like Valentine's Day was the hardest party day for me as an elementary teacher and um, if you want to know more I'll tell you more like ask me about it in class and so that sparked further conversation right and so then that next day she asked me about it and it was great because it opened up this conversation that everybody was um privy to um as well and then i've had a few that are just like totally sad that they that we stop it right that they don't get a new name temp for the next couple of weeks um and i'm like okay y'all i don't mind doing this for a couple of weeks but like this is you know it takes quite a bit of time to sit down and read their responses and really i try very hard to in my response connect to what they've said to me and then either build on it, ask them a question to further go, or give them something about me that connects to that. So. And Beth, you're pointing out something important here is that there is a time investment that goes into community building. So it should have a purpose. It should be set up to help students succeed in your class, to help them learn the content better, to learn soft skills, I, I think someone had said. So there should be a reason for it because it's gonna have to be worth the time that you dedicate to it. And I understand completely you're saying, all right, we've 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 done that and we're gonna build community in other ways, kind of <laughs> moving forward. Yeah. Um, Melissa mentions in the chat that asking students to potentially physically move and talk with different classmates is also important for building that community beyond those little pockets of individual community. And others had said, yes, people have the tendency to sit in the same spot. I always sat in the same spot. I would move people if they were in my spot. So it's it's something where getting people to, to get beyond their own individual space is excellent. And this also reminds me that all of these events are archived. You can watch them. So if you wanted to hear Tracy Brimhall talk about um, our students, I was going to say talk about our students' bodies, but like more their, their physical health and presence and well-being and all of that. Um, that event was last week. It was amazing. You should check it out in our archive if you didn't have the opportunity to see it. Um, and there's a lot more going on in the chat. If you're not able to see the chat, it's robust. There's links being shared and all of those kind of things. So definitely check that out. So we have 
10-ish minutes left. I want to get out a, a minute early in case anyone has a, a one o'clock meeting. I want to give the opportunity to, you know, get a snack in the bathroom, whatever. We have about 10, 10-ish minutes left. What else has kind of been on your mind? Because I have one, but if anyone else has anything on their mind that they want to share before I throw mine out there, I'm, I'm curious. I, honestly, I, I was kind of hoping people didn't say anything. Dang, Melissa got in. What do you got, Melissa? <laughs> Mine's pretty specific. I think we'll still have time for yours. I have several students this semester who grew up in the foster care system and now no longer have support. I reached out to the Office of First Generation Students, so I talked to Rebecca Paz, but are any of you aware of any other resources for students who kind of aged out of the foster care system and really don't have a parental figure? That's just something that's happening a surprising amount um, this fall as compared to my past classes. And if you know a specific resources for the students, I was curious if you knew of any. Melissa, I don't know of a specific resource, but I know that Tara Coleman has been looking into this, at least in the last couple of years. So she might be somebody who can connect you or knows the frustrations that the students are feeling and can get you connected. Awesome. Thank you. I'll reach out to her. But if does somebody does else? know, let me know so I can tell Tara too. Yeah. Does anyone else know? I, I myself do not know. All right. So the the question that I have, and it just keeps coming back up. I know that this was part of Dr. Gonzalez's presentation earlier this semester. Definitely check that out. But operationally, how are you balancing rigor and empathy in your classes this semester? Operationally, not theoretically, but like what are the things you're doing? Because I'm continuing to have colleagues tell me that they're having to pick one or the other I'm having students say their class is either empathetic or rigorous. It's not both. These are not mutually exclusive terms, but it appears that we're having a hard time putting this into practice. So I am looking for the coolest, most practical tips and techniques that I can pass on to colleagues for how you're successfully operationalizing this balance. Now, we could spend the rest of our time complaining about it's hard to do. I get that. I'd rather kind of focus on the solutions that we have to the issue because the issue is well documented. I gave you one earlier in just uh, allowing my class to arrange themselves. And I got an immediate response of someone who felt like her, though she hadn't voiced it, she felt like her connection to the group was much better. That is if we'd heard her and we, she hadn't told us, but you know, you, you can observe your students well enough to know who is really the outgoing person, who is the quiet one who needs uh, more engagement and so forth. And so I, I try to make it part of a lesson about space. And so I immediately move to how the spaces that we arrange are things that others live in. And that as designers and planners, we have to think about that. So it's, it's immediate response of how that, that little exercise and my whatever statement made, uh, made a contribution to what they're learning. So I love that. And I love that for smaller classes, but I might be in a class where I honestly don't know who the outgoing students are and who the shy students are. I might not know all their names if my class is very large. So yeah, that will work in some contexts. What do we have that kind of generalizes? And there was a question in the chat earlier that someone had asked about community building. You know, it's, it might be different in a large class. How do we balance this in particular with the large classes? Because my anecdotal you know, accounts are suggesting that people are probably more empathetic in their smaller classes than their larger classes right now. Yes, Andy. Um, I was gonna say, this is a, like, in the same vein as what LaBarbera said, in that like helping students identify how, like what their own individual aspect of it rather right so I think that even sometimes students when they're feeling like they don't quite fit in or whatnot um, sometimes they don't even recognize they just think oh this is the way the class is and they don't realize until it's changed that it didn't have to be that way so I think one of the things that I like to do with my students is that when I give them a reading is to give them like prompt questions to go along with it that they think about and that they submit on canvas um, and you could vary this as to like how, how in depth you went with different students, but having them think of specific ways that theories or like really like theoretical concepts 
how they can think about that practically in real life. Because I think that for a lot of students, this rigor piece, we focus on like the really hard concepts, the, the theoretical, the academic. Um, but if the students don't have a framework within which to like situate those, those concepts and those ideas, it's really hard for them to stick. And so asking them like, what does this apply to? How do, how do you see this? Um, giving them an opportunity to write their ideas down in you know a notebook or whatever and then either submit it or just say like at the beginning of class like I want you to talk to you know three or four people around you and compare ideas like what are the and then what are the questions that you still have what are the things you know in which ways does it best apply and just take a few minutes out of class even in a big lecture hall to listen to a couple voices have a few students say something and if you have them submit a little thing on canvas before class, you can read through a couple and then post up on the screen, you know, okay, so here are a couple things that people said. And I think that this is a great application of this theory. And so that you're taking students real lived experiences and connecting it to complex ideas. So this, this idea of personalizing assignments is awesome, right? And, and Ted is talking about personalized assignments in the chat as well, giving students options on how they complete it, creating relevance, creating application, all of those kind of things. Love it. I'm also going to probably argue that it's probably something that, again, works better in smaller classes than larger classes. So I'll even make my question a little bit more pointed. Late policies, missed work, attendance policies. How do we balance that? Because one of the issues that I've had, and, and I know a number of us have talked about this before, is my class is often the most empathetic class my students are taking, which means that my class often becomes the last priority for overwhelmed students. Because I know that my class is going to allow for the late work, my class is not going to penalize for the absence, those kind of things. And then they dig themselves this huge hole, and then it's my class they didn't succeed in. And nothing I think breaks your heart is when you did all you could for a student and they still failed, right? It's So how is it structurally that we can kind of create this balance in our classes so that we are not overwhelming and overloading our students, but we're still supporting their success without letting them kind of have that side effect of empathy be they never emerge in our class? So one of the ways that um, I actually uh, implemented some of those into my classrooms at ESU was that uh, for um, attendance policy, I allowed our students to miss up to two weeks worth of class periods. So if it was a Tuesday, Thursday class, they could miss up to four class periods, or if it was a Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I was a little bit less than that, I don't remember the exact numbers, but they were allowed to miss a specific number of class periods per semester, um, no questions asked. So if it was just a day needed a mental health day, great. They had a doctor's appointment, fantastic, um, that I wasn't going to push them on and that they could take for whatever reason they needed. But after those set amount of days, that's when attendance points would start being taken off. And with assignments, I had a just kind of general policy of after three calendar days where this is due, I will not accept it, but I will accept it up through those three days with just kind of 10% docked each day. So that way the assignments are still being uh, a lot of the times completed by students so they're still engaging with that material but they are understanding that there are possible repercussions or consequences to not having that in on time to help promote that responsibility within the students as well so i, I will say and there's there's a couple of different ways to think about it sarah k kearns is talking about you know maybe incentivizing getting it in earlier on time rather than kind of having a decrement after the fact i myself don't employ late penalties and it's actually much less philosophical. There's, there's a philosophy that goes along with it, but it's just hard. It, it increases my workload. If I have 200 people in class and I have to do these kinds of things, it's I just don't want to deal with it. So basically, I take the assignment or I don't. Um, and if I take the assignment, it gets graded and they get feedback. Um, and that's not to say that anything that anyone else does is different. One of the recommendations that I make my students in the Principals of College teaching is feel free to reject any advice I give you. You know, that's that's the thing that we've all got to kind of be powerful to do. But that wouldn't work for me just because it's complicated. That is a very common strategy. And I think that is getting a little bit more toward that balance. And I appreciate that. Um, one of the things I also kind of want to amplify, as Melissa said, how about we thank them? Right. Like one of the things we can do 
to support our students learning is those little kind of expressions that we care about you, we support your learning, we're here for you and those kind of things. And that's in addition to whatever our policies are. And this is something that any of us can do tomorrow. It's one of the things that I've advocated for a long time is just thank your students. Because if your students make the choice to not show up, if your students make the choice to not enroll, then you do not have the opportunity to teach. And even if you, you know, consider yourself a researcher um, and not a teacher, and this would be an odd Zoom meeting to have happened into if that's how you perceive yourself. Um, but if you saw yourself as a researcher, not a teacher, um, without those undergraduates, you don't have a place to do your research. So it's, it's one of those things where I think being genuine in the gratitude we pay to our students is a very small thing that all of us can do in all of our classes. So thank you, Melissa, for sharing that. Um, let's see, I'm trying to keep up with the chat. Melissa also talks about explaining why we have policies, right? And our policies are set up or should be set up to facilitate their learning and success, not to create barriers to that learning and success. So letting them know that and getting around the stereotype that instructors are the adversary to your performance, um, I think is, is really helpful. Um, and then other people are sharing other things about their deadlines, their hard deadlines, their soft deadlines, how strict their late policies are and those kind of things. Um, we are about out of time. What I want to do before we conclude, uh, we will have a, a post-event survey. We'll have these after all of these. Next week, we have a wonderful event. It will not be a teaching chat next week. It'll be a presentation. And if you think you're stressed, overloaded, and dealing with crisis, next week, we're going to meet Andy Thompson. Andy Thompson is the director of the Office of Student Life. And Andy deals with a lot more than any of us do individually because all the stuff we're dealing with individually, he deals with too. And he's gonna help us understand how we can support K-State students. And one of the previous titles of, of his talks where they really like is how we follow through on that promise of support. So it's gonna be excellent to kind of hear him share his thoughts about that next week. If anyone wants to stick around for a second, I'll be here for a minute. Otherwise, thank you so much for attending today. Look forward to all of these and hearing all the stuff that y'all are doing, all the challenges, all the ideas. And we'll see you next time, um, 12 noon next week. Thank you so much. Thank you.